Hi, welcome to another episode of Recover Louder. I'm your host, Mike Paddleford, and I recover louder. This show first started with the hopes that we could help end the stigma of substance use disorder and try to help to save some lives. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life and recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove to people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people. People, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense I'm proud to say that I recover loud I never thought I could but I'm so proud that I discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny I needed recovery I still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. I recover loud here to tell my own story I recover proud save a life of like 40 I recover loud yeah I recover loud I recover I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud, I recover loud, here to tell my own story, I recover proud, save a life of like 40, I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud, I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud, I recover, 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 I recover loud. Welcome to another episode of Recover Loud. I'm your host, Mike Paddleford, and I recover loud. Today's guest is Mackenzie Kelly from Bangor. Uh, Mackenzie, welcome. Uh, mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing your story with us today. Where, where did you grow up? Yep. Um, I actually grew up in Bangor, Maine. And um, I don't know, I come from a really good family, but my parents weren't really around, so... It was mostly just uh, me trying to fit in, I guess, and I didn't really know how or what that looked like. So um, that's actually um, how I got into drugs. What age would you say you first used a substance, whether it was alcohol or marijuana? Yeah, I was 12 when I first started smoking pot. Yeah. It was that a regular thing for you, or was that just a, it happened and then... No, I used once, and then um, when I was 15, I started smoking regularly. And how easy was it for you to do that? I mean, it was just normal. Yeah. All, all of my friends smoked pot. Everybody I hung out with was, you know, I was a freshman, they were all seniors, and then, you know, we partied on the weekends or whatever, and... I had people who were older and 21 that were, you know, buying us alcohol and right. stuff, so. Yeah. Um, and, and how long did it take before that progressed into something that was a little more serious? Um, by the time I was 17, I was addicted to Oxycontin. Oh. Um, I, all my friends were using opiates and, um, you know, I'd see them like nodding out on the couch and I'd be like, what is wrong with you? Like, that just looks freaking terrible. Right. You know? And, um, I had kind of gotten in some trouble, um, at high school because I was skipping school and smoking weed. Um, so my parents actually sent me to a different high school and, um, I, like I said, I didn't know how to fit in. And I was in vocational school, so I remember having like this crazy crush on this guy, and um, he did pills. Mm -hmm. And that was like, I guess, kind of my way in. Like, I felt like the only way he would like me was if I did kind of like what he did. What else did you get from doing that? I mean, did that relationship last? Uh... To be honest with you, um, I had started stealing money from my father's business, and uh, so my parents knew that something was going on, but they didn't exactly know what it was, Um, and I thought I was going on vacation, but, you know, during that time, it was like um, around the year 2000, and these... um, 
child programs were kind of coming into swing, I guess. And uh, my parents sent me to like a lockdown facility in Jamaica. I thought I was going on vacation. Um, so that put the kibosh to our relationship pretty quick. Yeah. You know. Um, so how old were you there? In I was 17. 17. Um, and how long did that program last? So I was there 11 months. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually graduate the program. Um, I signed out three months after my 18th birthday. Um, but it, once you turn 18, you can sign out. But um, I had kind of grown this relationship with my family with my parents and I had like craved this acceptance from them for a really long time like this validation that I just never got and I was really hoping you know their version of my success in the program would kind of change that relationship so I stayed um, and when I got out I was like what I call is programized, right? We were almost brainwashed into feeling or thinking certain things. So uh, when I got out, I just, it was fear that kind of drove me, that kept me um, straight for a lack of a better way to put it. Right. You know. And how long did you stay? Clean? Yeah. Um, well, off of opiates, it was about uh, five years. Mm -hmm. But almost, I mean, within six months, no, I'm just kidding. Within a couple of weeks, I was smoking pot again. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people talk about marijuana being a gateway. Uh, do you see it as such for your recovery? Um, I mean, I, I don't smoke pot anymore. Mm -hmm. um, do I see it as a gateway? Eh, not necessarily. Okay. For me, I think when I was a kid, it was cigarettes. Yeah. To be yeah. honest. Yeah, I mean, once we find that we can get a benefit from something, mm -hmm. you know, um, then that um, desire or willingness to try something yep. is there, you know. Um, so what happened to get you to start using again after all that? Um, to be honest, my best friend was dating a cop. And I had, you know, we'd had previous discussions about how much Oxycontin was worth. And um, this, this old man had died, and this woman asked my friend's boyfriend to get rid of the pills. And he was like, well, do you want a receipt for that? And she said, no. So he took all the pills, pretended to flush them down the toilet, and then he knew nobody else but me. And I'd been clean for so long that I, I didn't know what the hell to do with them. Right. You know what I mean? But I had this one guy that would, you know, probably buy them. So I, that's kind of how it started. And I sold them, or sold him, like, the 80s and 40s. But I kept the 20s for yeah. myself. And, yeah. you know, it's kind of all downhill from there. Yeah, and, and honestly, that's how my addiction started, too. Uh, I, was, I was getting a prescription myself for, for uh, herniated discs. But I didn't take any of them. I sold everything I got for, like, the first four years. And that money was my first addiction, mm -hmm. you know, the power, people wanting what I had, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, I kind of got off on the idea that I could keep some people away and allow other people in, you know, um, and just force them to, to want to be my friend, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually a doctor cut me off and uh, I had to start sharing. Every time I sold one, I did one. And uh, so I could pass a urine test. And uh, it didn't take long on 40 milligram Oxycontin to, to get addicted. Mm -hmm. um, so, how long did, were you able to keep up that lifestyle? I mean, that started it all over again. Mm -hmm. And um, I started buying pills for personal use. And then, before you know it, I was, I had you know, connections, right? right? So I was buying them for really cheap and selling them. So that's how I supported my habit for about, um, uh, probably about four or five years. Yeah. And, you know, it's this, for me, it was a really quick progression, I guess, yeah, yeah. because it was basically unlimited access for really cheap. And, um, and like you said, it, it, 
I didn't really feel like I had any power or control when I was a child. So I really think I kind of craved that. Um, and just feeling like I had some importance, even yeah. though it wasn't a negative aspect. Right, right. And I mean, we don't know that it's negative. It's something that no. we've always wanted, you know, growing up, that acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you mentioned when you went into that, that program, you were you know, hoping the acceptance from your parents. Um, so it, it's all, you know, we grow up wanting that. And when we don't have it, we find a way to get it. Mm -hmm. um, so finding healthy ways to find that and feel that, you know, is really what keeps us, you know, in on the path of recovery um, later on, um, because that doesn't go away. We just have to find another way to, to fill that. Um, So, uh, how about legal trouble? How did that? Mm, yep, that I've been in a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I say four or five years of that whole situation with the oxies. Um, I actually got uh, busted with a very large amount of them mm -hmm. when I was 27, and um, I had never spent a day in jail. I'd never been in trouble for anything. So they actually gave me an eight-year sentence to to serve. Okay. And um, so I went away for two years, and I didn't change one thing. You know, uh, at first, prison basically just gave me some more connections for when I got out. And um, at the time, there really was no what they call now reentry. You know, yeah. um, I came from a good family, so oh, you have somewhere to go. They have money, you know, whatever. I didn't get any services, not one, when I got let out. And what year was that? That was in 2012. Yeah. Yeah. See, I was in prison back in uh, 1996. I got out. And same thing. There was nothing offered. Mm -hmm. um, they gave a, a $50 check, I think it was, and a bus ticket if I needed it. And, uh, you know, sent me on my way. I had to report for probation. Um, but, you know, even even that wasn't offering me something. It was just, you know, reporting to the, the man, you know, uh, somebody telling me what I could and couldn't do. Um, and, you know, when I got out of prison, I actually, I tried hard to, uh, to, to stay on the right path. And then I, once I got those prescriptions for oxys, it was, you know, all those, those things come back to, to me, you know, an easy way to make money. Um, I knew people were going to buy them and, uh, you know, it just made it, it, it was accessible, you know, and easy. Uh, the prescriptions I was getting, uh, you know, you mentioned different sizes and keeping the lower dose. I did the same thing. You know, I was getting oxy 40s, oxy 20s, oxy 15s, um, all each month. You know, so I could do some, sell the rest, and you know, eventually I sold less and less, did more and more, and then I started buying them, and I just keep buying more, and then I shared with my wife, and then we bought twice as much, and that whole life, you know, 20 years, um, that lasted before it, you know, finally came crashing in, and uh, so at some point you decided that that you were done with all of that and uh, you know you've been you know staying away from it for how long now I've been clean for five years, five years. Uh, but to be honest with you that first prison bid didn't do it for me no no I I went on the run from probation for five years mm -hmm. and um, it went from oxys to heroin yes. And I was just a hot mess for years because uh, it became opiates and then crack. And it was just, I didn't leave the house. And like I said, I was on the run. I'd go and meet my guy and I was in the trunk. You know what I mean? Like just some real shady stuff that I did just to um, keep up my drug habit and to um, make money. Right? Yeah. Um, so it just so happened that 
you know, I had these like feelings of like real hopelessness and I want, I really wanted to die, to be honest with you. It just got to that point where I did not care about my life. I mm -hmm. didn't want to be around and have um, the guts to actually kill myself. So it was like killing mm -hmm. myself slowly, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I got picked up and I got a seven year sentence for drugs. And um, the first year, I was just really angry, just angry at the world, myself, my family, the girl who called the cops on me. Right. Um, I thought of all the ways I was going to burn her house down. <laughs> because it's her fault. Right, right. of it's course. It wasn't else. my fault. Right. It wasn't right. my fault at all. Right. Um, and then after that first year, I was like, all right, you know, I got to let this go, you know. And uh, about three years into my bed, um, I started taking what's called inside out classes, which are um, people who are inside um, incarcerated that uh, actually go to school with outside students. And at the time we were actually working with a program through MIT. And so there were MIT and Harvard students on the outside and uh, women and men who were incarcerated, so in Wyndham and in Charleston. Mm -hmm. And we had this professor, Lee Perlman. He was amazing. I still work with him. Um, anyways, we had this day, right, where um, we had stayed over late at, at the end of class and this guy was talking from Charleston was talking about um, a murder he had committed. And it was like a restorative justice circle, kind of. Mm -hmm. And there was another woman in the class whom her mother had actually been brutally raped by somebody who had been let out on, um, on parole. And she actually had a huge part in getting parole kind of rescinded in the state of Pennsylvania. And at that moment in time, she said the worst possible um, choice she could have made, you know, because at the time she was like, you know, she was very bitter. She wanted revenge, et cetera, et cetera. So Lee says, OK, um, and he says the woman's name and he says a man's name and he says, you know, pretend like she is the son of your victim. What would you say to her? And he just starts crying. And he was like, I'm sorry. I'm just so sorry. And of course, I'm on the Zoom screen and I start crying. Yeah. And uh, Lee, after, you know, the whole exchange, he says to me, he's like, you know, I see you over there. He's like, you know, why are you crying? And I said, you know, I, I know I don't have a violent crime and it may not be, you know, that severe, but at the same time, I've done irreparable harm to the people yeah. that I care about. Um, and really it's about me just wanting that forgiveness for them from them. And so we had a short, you know, a brief conversation and I get out of class and I immediately call my mother and I was like, you know, I'm so sorry for what I put you through. You know, this is just time for me, but it's time that you're taking, I'm, I'm taking away from you because when you're, right. when you're incarcerated, your family is incarcerated with you. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, she said, Mackenzie, we've, we've already forgiven you. You just need to forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know how to do that, you know, and I really didn't, I had no clue. And um, it just kind of started the journey from there is how, how can I possibly forgive myself for something that I've done? And it was just a really learning, learning, growing process of trying to figure out what that looked like for me. Yeah. So um, that's kind of where my journey started of wanting to change my life. And how long have you been out now? I've been out a year. Um, I was in for probably two years after that, and um, I got out, and uh, I had every drive to stay clean, which I have, um, but to be honest with you, um, incarceration is uh, traumatic in itself, and uh, re-entry from prison is also traumatic in itself, mm. because those... Those five years that I was in, almost, it just slapped me right in the face as soon as I got out. I didn't know how to live um, sober 
and not incarcerated. Right. You know, right. and and uh, my my parents didn't understand what that felt right. like. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I had support, but in my reentry, I didn't have much of a support, and I didn't know how to live. So. Yeah. Um, and and what did it take for you to figure that out? Um. To be honest with you, I went to a main prisoner reentry network a weekly meeting, and I'd been actually going to them a year prior to my release from prison. And it just took somebody saying, you know, what's going on with you? How are you doing? And, and I got real vulnerable and I started yeah. crying. And I was like, I just, I feel so alone. Like nobody understands what I'm going through. And that was, that was real, that was raw. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, all these people started, you know, kind of coming to my side and, you know, cheering me on and, and saying, you know, if you need support in any way, I've got you. Nice. And um, really, it's, it's just those moments that seem maybe small to other people, but were just huge to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? And, you know, it's those small moments that that really it, the important ones we grab onto mm -hmm. keep us going you yep. know and it feels good because I mean I know in my case there's there's lots of moments I never imagined I'd get to um, you know reunifying with my kids having my kids support me and accept me and forgive me um, you know it was huge because those were the people that I hurt in my addiction you know uh, my daughter was 16 before she ever met a sober version of me uh, and my boys um, my oldest son had already moved out. Uh, my middle son was living with family in Massachusetts, you know, and feeling, I didn't know it, but he was feeling abandoned for four years when I thought I was doing him a favor, you know. Um, so getting all of that stuff back, you know, just the little things that built up to that moment, you know, really kept me going. Um, and then, you know, the ultimate payoff once I got them, you know, uh, uh, to love me again, you know. Um, I actually started working as a recovery coach and now I'm um, the recovery coach coordinator for Kennebec County so I actually have other recovery coaches underneath me um, and we go into the jails and um, yeah and we coach people who are still incarcerated which is huge right yeah. I can actually mm -hmm. go into a jail and and not leave on bail conditions. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, jail gives them an opportunity. Um, you know, it, for me, it gave me a lot of opportunity to think about my life. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, even just going to 12-step meetings inside jail um, didn't do a lot for me when I got out. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, now that we can get in there, talk to people, give them that, that support, that encouragement, the guidance, uh, the reentry programs that are there for people now, they can come out, they can get into a you know stable housing situation um, and have a supportive, loving community, really, to, to help guide them. You know, mm -hmm. So that's, that's some pretty important work. For me, the opposite of addiction is connection, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. And um, in order for me to feel like I belong, I need to connect mm -hmm. with other people who feel the same or you know, who understand exactly what it is. And when I couldn't rub together two days, my five years is monumental, Absolutely. right? And I always make sure I tell people, listen, you have you have a month, you have a week. That's huge. Oh, yeah. You know, doesn't matter how long, if you have the drive to do that and you want to change your life, that's all that matters. Yeah. doesn't matter how much time you've been in that Absolutely. Recovery. You know, I remember my first day counting hours, and you know, I was on Facebook, Facebook early on. You know, uh, six hours, eight hours, seventeen hours, and people are, you know, encouraging me, and it felt good. And then I was sitting back in the corner of my bedroom, planning my my first relapse. You know, um, and uh, you know, it, it was it was kind of crazy because I was doing it alone. You know, I had people who were supporting me, but I wasn't telling, being honest. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was just uh, sitting in my room. You know, so getting connected with the community outside, um, having support that, you know, I could really feel, um, you know, is, is pretty important. Um, and growing up, you know, it was connection. We saw it and we got connected to a community of people, um, you know, but what that did was disconnected us from the people we really wanted to be connected with. 
gotcha. you know, our family and, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, congratulations on, on being out and, and staying in recovery for five years uh, for all the work that you're doing. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much. I yeah, no problem. Um, you also have a podcast. You want to talk about that for a minute real quick? Yeah, we actually run on WMPG and WERU. Um, I run, well, me and another woman, Linda Doloff, we run uh, Reentry Sisters, and it's a program for women who are returning to the community. We offer them services, get them connected, um, you know, uh, to somebody who understands about getting out. And uh, her and I actually um, do a podcast. It's called Justice Radio. Uh, we're one of, well, two of six other people who run the show. Um, it runs on Sundays at noon. Uh, you can actually um, listen to it on WMPG uh, Radio, mm -hmm. and uh, it's also on Spotify iHeartRadio, whole oh, lots of other things. That's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. We'll keep it up. Yeah, thank and, you so uh, much. You know, thanks for sharing. Yeah, I appreciate all of that. that. Recover loud, everyone. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life and recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recovered loud here to tell my own story